Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to start beating extinction. I'm, I'm really so enjoying this conference, a conference about optimism. I'm an optimist by nature, and it is so exciting to hear these success stories. And we're, we've begun a little bit late, so um, I think we're going to dive straight in. And our first speaker this afternoon, now, let me make sure I get this pr pronounced right, is Nilanga, Nilanga um, Jayasinghe. And she works with World Wildlife Fund in their Asian program. She is an expert on working with a lot of different Asian megafauna. And today she is going to um, start by talking about one of the great success stories in Asia, which is the story of the great one-horned rhino. Uh, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, so today, uh, I'd like to tell you about the time I spent about eight hours on the back of an elephant looking for a rhino. So this is March 2016 uh, in the grasslands of Nepal's Chitwan National Park, where, um, which is kind of excellent habitat for the greater one-horned rhino, which is one of three species of rhino found in Asia. And as you can see in this picture, uh, the color is a little off, so I'm not sure it's very clear, but it's very distinct in that it has this armor-plated looking skin that you can identify. Also, it's also known as the Indian rhino. So speaking of rhinos, um, today we're in the middle of a poaching crisis, which you all may not be a stranger to. Every day we hear stories of rhinos being killed and uh, killed for their horns in particular. And in the midst of all that, I'm here to actually talk to you guys about a bright spot in rhino conservation. It's a story about bringing the greater one-horned rhino back from the brink of extinction. And it's one of Asia's biggest success stories, as Nigella mentioned. And it's one that I feel incredibly lucky to be part of. So let's take a journey and first find out why are we on the back of an elephant looking for a rhino? This is why. If you could see the grasses in these areas, they grow much taller than elephants even at points. And not surprisingly, it's called elephant grass. And um, it's really hard to find anything in these areas. So you have to kind of go on elephant back to, to look for rhinos and other wildlife. And they're very important team members in the field work that we do in places like Chitwan National Park. So, Speaking of elephants and rhinos, let's look at why we're looking for a rhino again. But before we really go into that, let's talk a little bit about the history of rhino conservation. So you'll see that rhinos, the greater one horn rhino, was once found in this large orange block that you see, all the way from northeastern Pakistan to the edges of northeastern India. And they were abundant, considered a pest species, and hunted for sport. So after centuries of hunting pressure, habitat loss, and poaching, numbers, not surprisingly, collapsed. So at the turn of the 20th century, there were only 200 rhinos left, about around 200 or so. And they were only found in two populations. You can see here on the right, Kaziranga National Park in India, and Chitwan National Park on the left in Nepal. So this was an alarming situation, and that's when governments of both countries, India and Nepal, came together to figure out what are we going to do about the situation? How are we going to reverse this downward trend and make sure that rhinos make a comeback? So how you do that is by protecting the rhinos, making sure they're safe where they live, protecting their habitat to ensure that they have a place to live, and by expanding their range back into where they used to exist and increasing populations through what we call translocation, which is the act of moving rhinos from places where they're abundant today to places where they used to exist but are no longer present in their, within their historic range, as you can see. So these actions were actually successful. And this is where they're found today, in other pockets of habitat within their historic range, and they're expanding. So translocation is a really important point, as one of the things I mentioned to make sure we help them expand their populations. So this story 
in terms of success, if you go back to numbers, we, we talked about how there were 200 at the turn of the 20th century. Today, there's 3,500 greater one-horned rhinos. And this is incredibly successful in matter, in the, you know, in one century that we have been able to get this far. And it is so, it's, the success is reflected in the fact that it's the only large mammal in Asia's recent history to have been downlisted from endangered to vulnerable on the IUCN, which is the International U Union for the Conservation of Nature's red list of threatened species. So we consider this a success, but we still have to keep working on it because you know, they're by no means out of danger. Um, and then if you're looking at individual countries that they're found in, Nepal and India, Nepal is well on its way to achieving its 2020 goal, population goal. So is India. So what is our goal, which very much reflects the goals of these two countries, is 3,800 by the year 2020. So we have a couple more years to go. We're hopeful that we will get there and make sure these rhinos are making a comeback. So at this point, let's head back to Chitwan National Park to our translocation story. So we're gathered early in the morning, about 250 people and about 30 elephants who are gathered to move five rhinos from Chitwan National Park to Bardia National Park's Babai Valley, which is more than 100 miles away, to establish a new population in a place where they used to exist but are no longer present. Chitwan has an abundance of rhinos, so it, it could help start off new populations in other places where they were before. So the process starts while well, everybody heads out into the grasslands, and once a suitable candidate is located, there will be about 10 elephants that will encircle the rhino. So as you can imagine, the rhino's fast, trying to move around, you have to get the elephants around it. And then the teams will move in closer and get a technician up onto a tree, because as you can imagine, it's kind of hard to dart a rhino from a moving elephant. So you have to get him in a static position, and then he has the opportunity to dart the rhino. It takes about six minutes for the rhino to go down. And remember, this has been done for a number of decades, and it's done very safely with experienced people who know what they're doing, so it does not harm the rhino. So once the rhino goes down, we have scientific teams descending on the rhino to make sure that you, know, you get uh, measurements, you get blood samples, and any other kind of information they need. And then you put a collar on the rhino, which you will see there, uh, one of our scientists putting on, on the rhino. And why do we call her? We call her to understand how they're doing in their new home when they're released, uh, what sorts of habitat are they using, and how they're adjusting to their new conditions and where they're going, what are they doing, et cetera. And the coolest thing about this right now is that scientists can actually track their movements real time through apps on their phones from the satellite signal that the caller emits. And that, I think, is really amazing to be able to ensure that rhinos are you know, doing well in their areas. And the other important thing why we collar them is to ensure that they're protected from threats like poaching. So poaching, as I mentioned before, is for their horns, which are in great demand um, because the horn is ground up into powder and used in traditional Asian medicine to cure various illnesses. But it's important to also understand that horns are made out of keratin, the same material as our fingernails. So it's kind of hard to imagine that you know, what could more or less be equivalent to nail clippings from all of us in this room is more valuable than gold. So they still, because of that, they remain in high demand. And so we have to remain vigilant to protect these rhinos where they're found. And in terms of protection, Nepal is very unique in that park rangers that you see here, part of protected area staff, collaborate with the army to protect wildlife in their protected areas. And this is also unique in that Nepal, actually many of you may not know that Nepal is a leader in wildlife conservation. And this is significantly because of the engagement and investment in conservation that you get from all the way up from government down to grassroots community level. They all work together, they collaborate, and they work to make sure their wildlife is protected. And this leadership was actually catalyzed during a dark period of political instability between 2000 and 2005 when um, Chitwan National Park 
lost one third of its rhino population. It's a big hit, as you can imagine. And this galvanized everyone even more to do more for conservation and to ensure that tragedies like that didn't happen again. So everyone came together because a rhino, it's a matter of pride for them. It's very closely connected to their national identity. So you want to make sure the rhinos are protected and doing well um, in the wild. And so through these hard lessons that they learned on the ground, um, Nepal was able to develop what is called a zero poaching toolkit. So as you can see, these six pillars, when they come together, and if you do that well, you can ensure that there is zero poaching of wildlife. And particularly, as I mentioned, the cooperation component is really important, that everyone is working together, all stakeholders are coming together. Um, and working towards ensuring that wildlife are protected where they're found. And this was, has been so successful that um, Nepal actually celebrated four 365-day periods of zero poaching in the earlier half of 2016. So this is you know, pretty significant. And now the toolkit is being used elsewhere in other countries. So it's, it's showing, demonstrating leadership and showing, sharing those lessons learned so others could take it from there and use it for their conservation purposes as well. So from there, let's head back to our translocation story. And once these rhinos are darted, if you remember, we darted the rhino, did the scientific examinations. Once they're darted, they're then taken to these crates that you see that are placed on the bed of the truck and loaded in and given an antidote to wake up. So as you can imagine, they're not quite happy when they wake up. It's suddenly disoriented. Where am I? What am I doing here? So they are then driven uh, more than 10 hours overnight to their new home in Babai Valley. So they're di driven overnight in particular because it can get really hot during the day. and You don't want the rhinos to overheat. So the overnight drive is actually much more beneficial for them. So here you'll see... Two rhinos coming into their new home. Uh, one is a uh, male in the prime of his life, and the other one is a pregnant female. So how do you think they each reacted when they were released? Any guesses as to which, the, which one the, the young male is? <laughs> hey, he was angry. He was ready to kill the crate, kill anyone in his way. There's from a different angle. And the pregnant female was very careful, almost daintily stepping out of the crate. He really, he really was mad. And then there they go off into their happily ever after. And this ever after can only be happy, though, if they and their habitats are protected. So what do we want out of things like these translocations? This. That pregnant female gave birth to a bouncing baby boy. And as we can see, a new native generation has taken root in their new home. And this is what we hope for all rhinos going forward. Thank you very much. Nilonga, thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful, uplifting, fun story. Um, I think we'll wait and keep all questions to, uh, to the end because we're running a little bit late. Our next speaker is Eric, uh, should be Eric Miller, yes it is. Um, Eric is a wonderful and really famous uh, veterinarian for zoos and wildlife. But today, he is not going to talk so much, I think, about that aspect of his work at St. Louis Zoo as the um, story of a remarkable animal, um, the rescuing the hellbenders. So um, Eric, please come up um, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for the Smithsonian Institute and all the sponsors for the meeting. Um, I said today I'm a little more dressed up than I normally am, but I have a hellbender tie, and I have very few occasions to wear that, so this seemed appropriate. And I'd also li like to thank, before I start, Jeff Etling, Dr. Jeff Etling, who's our curator of herpetology who leads this program, and I'm giving the talk as director of the St. Louis Wildcare Institute, which is our conservation arm. 
This is one of 12 centers in the Institute for Conservation Medicine that we support. Well, what is a hellbender? It's an amphibian, it's a large aquatic salamander, and there are two subspecies, the eastern Cryptobranchus alleghaniensis, alleghaniensis and the Ozark hellbender, Cryptobranchus bishop bishopi. They live in, only in cool, clear streams with moderate current. Cryptobranchus in Greek means hidden gills, and they have relatives, the Chinese giant salamander, which is shown here on the upper right, and the Japanese giant salamander. And I was told to bring visuals and here's a life-size model of a Missouri hellbender. So you can see for a salamander, these are up to several pounds. They're a very large, very large amphibian. Hellbender is a kind of an interesting name, but it's not the best of them. They've been called in colloquialisms mud devils, devil dogs, Allegheny alligators, and who could not love a snot otter? <laughs> The range here, and I'll walk away for a minute, I hope you can hear me. This is the eastern hellbender, and the eastern hellbender also occurs in Missouri. And then this is the Ozark hellbender. Missouri is the only state to have both, uh, we used to say subspecies, I think now they've been classified as species. Interestingly enough, the eastern only occurs in northern flowing streams in Missouri. They all end up in the Mississippi at some point. And the Ozark hellbender only exists in south flowing streams that go through Arkansas. And so Missouri is the only state to have both subspecies. They're declining. And we know they were declining first with the Ozark hellbender. And we held a meeting 10 years ago where some of the eastern folks said, well, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, it's a problem there. But we've seen that problem, whatever it is, spread across the country. And all hellbenders are declining. We believe it's due to multiple factors, habitat degradation, things like siltation. I mentioned they need cool, uh, running clear water, water quality. I always say in a gross oversimplification, remember that amphibians are often sensitive to contaminants in parts per billion, where um, mammals and uh, perhaps ourselves are sensitive in parts per million. There's predation with turtles and snakes and some of the introduced fish in Missouri. Uh, disease, the amphibian chytrid fungus, and abnormalities. We're seeing many hellbenders like this one here on the right missing limbs. Uh, what we really like to say is they're the canary in the coal mine perhaps, for the Ozark ecosystem. In 2003, the eastern and Ozark hellbenders were listed as endangered in Missouri. We've, in 2006, we formed the Ron Gellner Center for Hellbender Conservation. More about that in just a moment. And in 2011, the Ozark hellbender was federally listed as endangered. The Ron Gellner Center was named after the man whose passion drove this. And if any of us ever doubt that one man's passion can make something happen, this is a, a case to pro prove that point. Ron unfortunately died of cancer uh, in 2005. Um, the goals were to reproduce the whole Ozark hellbender. They had never been done in captivity, nor any of the hellbenders in captivity, although the Asian giant salamanders had been reproduced, to retain that breeding stock and to eventually do reintroductions. Well, to breed hellbenders, it's not a, a, for an individual pair takes some facilities, but we've bred over 7,000, so we've pretty much filled the basement of our reptile house with aquariums and different breeding facilities for the hellbenders. We even have an outdoor stream that was built with support from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. You see that in the upper right. This is all the support system for that stream behind. And you see that cage door open on the top? The hellbenders don't crawl out. That's to keep the raccoons from getting in and grabbing a hellbender. So the reproduction process. We had infertile clutches for 2007 through 2010. But in October, we had the first world's first captive breeding of hellbenders. And if you think puppies and kittens and baby animals of other species are cute, that little hellbender on the left, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> and that's a juvenile on the right. So I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but to say that we've had multiple clutches. My comment when we first bred them, anybody can have a one-time event. But now we've bred multiple subspecies from different rivers with multiple pairs of hellbenders, and as I said, over 7,000. One of the things I'll go back a minute, we do do is we keep the different river systems separate because we're not sure yet of the different adaptations in each river. So the White River, the North Fork, they're all held in different places and only bred with each other. We felt that the, for successful reproduction, it was adequate space, provision of nest boxes, which we also provide in the wild now, environmental cycling, water quality, getting it right in, in the zoo for, in human care, 
uh, to mimic those clear, fast-running Ozark streams, a good sex ratio of the animals, and animal health. In recognition of this project, we got the uh, uh, we received the AZA's Edward Bean Award for most significant breeding, which you know is kind of like the Nobel Prize for zoos. So I won't go again go through all these numbers, but you can see how they're separated by river, and that our numbers overall uh, that's 4,000 at the zoo right now. There's 3,500 that have been released. At one point, 75% of the world's Ozark hellbenders lived in the St. Louis Zoo's herpetarium basement because the wild population got down to an estimated 900 animals. Last year, we re released 1,300 animals from 18 different clutches, and so far, we've released what I mentioned, over 3,500 in the wild. Initial survivability studies are promising, and I'll tell one brief story. Our first release occurred with head-started hellbenders from wild-caught eggs before we were doing the breeding. So we reduced them when they're about this big so they don't get eaten by trout and other predators. And they had transponders. And I had the good fortune to go out with them on the first time that we looked for them. And of the 11 animals released, we found 10 and alive. And we found the 11th transponder and a pile of otter poop. So at least the animal died a natural death. So that doesn't mean we've, we've, we've beaten the, the odds yet, but it, at least the initial results are uh, hopeful and encouraging. I believe this is one of many programs that show the one plan approach. That is not creating artificial lines between wild populations and populations in human care. And this certainly is one. They went from the wild, they came in, and fortunately within less than 10 years were able to reinforce the wild population. Saving species, and I always use that word advisedly because I think it's a, a loaded term, but it costs money. And in our institute, we've spent over 1.3 million, almost 1.4 million dollars over the past 12 years, including a $300,000 grant from the Love Foundation. Additionally, almost $300,000 from the Missouri Department of Conservation and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. One of the stories I love to tell is when we launched Wild Care 14 years ago, our development people said, well, we can raise money for those zebra programs and those cheetah programs, but what are we going to do about American bearing beetles and hellbenders? Who cares? And I'm a firm believer it's how you tell the story. Those are our two biggest fundraising centers, hellbenders and American bearing beetles. We're scrambling to find money for the others. So uh, one donor's given $175,000 for American bearing beetles because she likes the life story. I think we ought to look at other funding sources. I've always said that if they could do bikers for babies, motorcycle groups, why can't we go to Harley's Davidson and do Harley's for hellbenders? That certainly has black leather motorcycle jacket in my mind written all over it. I think it's also important as a, as a zoo that we present our story at the zoo. We have 3.2 million annual visitors. So those on the left, we're telling about some of our amphibian support in the field. And this is the Hellbender exhibit with a short video that talks about the programs. And the face there is the head of reptile conservation for the Missouri Department of Conservation, Dr. Jeff Brigler. So to the future, we'll continue breeding hellbenders as long as they need reinforcement. We'll continue head starting them for the release in the wild from ones that are uh, eggs that have been brought in. And ultimately, it's all about producing many more of these in Ozark rivers and streams. So I don't want to say we beat, uh, beat extinction yet. I think that's a little bit uh, too pr presumptuous. But I think we've taken some major steps in the right direction. I'd also like to thank our collaborators. Our previous speaker mentioned collaboration. Um, we couldn't have done this without all our collaborators, Missouri, the US Fish and Wildlife, Arkansas, and, and other institutions. So thank you for your attention. Eric, thank you so much. So our next speaker is Jean-Pierre. Uh, Jean-Pierre Santos is a Brazilian uh, ecologist, scientist, and he's been studying uh, neotropical carnivores for many years now. And we're delighted to have him here today. This is, I believe, his first presentation in English. So um, really, even more con congratulations. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. It's uh, really, really appreciated. I'm sorry to break the protocol here, 
but I'll be here underneath just switching the <laughs> bottle, okay? <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Smithsonian for the opportunity of the sharing our experience. Uh, I apologize for my language uh, limitation. Uh, I will try my best for you to understand. Uh, but I advertise that this will be a different experience I am Brazilian biologist and came here today to talk about how we change a strong tradition and guided a rural community to help an endangered species conservation. I was born and raised uh, almost totally isolated from the outside world. I was born in a in town at the sheds of the Serra da Canastra Mountains a plateau located in a corner of the miniaturized state, Southeast Brazil. This is a worldwide famous place because the National Park established 45 years ago to protect the waters, the source in the nature. Since very young, I have been in an intense relationship with nature. I was used to the environmental and wildlife protection science since my parents were national park agents. When I started to understand better my local universe, I could notice that livestock loss or the cultural beliefs used to trigger bad perceptions towards some species. This normally results is a persecution and killings. Over the years, this experience helped me uh, to build a good empirical base. But in order to more, I started to seek the higher education. And then um, I became a biologist with the purpose of the bridge of the economic activities and cultural values the wildlife conservation. One animal has been a symbol for me, perhaps because this persisting species has been almost always in the sense of the conflict with, with women. I don't like conflict. <laughs> <laughs> so I now introduce to you the manate wolf, the largest neotropical canid. It's a very peculiar species uh, out of the seven the large body south canids. It's the only solitary and omnivorous species. And on top of the, of the its elegance, it still resembles a fox stilts. Despite several interesting remakes, many of the wolves uh, severely threatening with uh, leaves across South America. Its range is most uh, of its distribution and area in Brazil, occupying open habitats preferentially. The intense woman uses this type the of off habitat, leading into landscape disturbance. Has been considered one of the main risks for the species presence in addition, perse persecution and killings mainly do livestock loss. We report is a major trade for the population reduction. Road killings and domestic dog disease some the list of the problem these species. In 2004, a team composed by researchers with our sort of expertise. Built in my home a transdisciplinary conservation program. Since then, the Man and the Wolf Conservation Program has been assessing a new information on the species besides proposing new actions to improve the species status. 
The long-term initiative combines research, education, and communication strategies with conservation practice. All the interface connect have, have been result in a better strategy for the species survival. We produce a lot of sciences along the 13 years of investigation with several parties, including the Smithsonian Institute. But I really have the research inside the focus on the what brought me here. Because the human end of conflict is one the, of the critical conservation streets, is mandatory the need of working together with local community in order to improve the species status education initiatives, target wolves, misperceptions by local people uh, have always been one of the goals of our program. Considering this, a segment within the program is a relation with the local community effects in the species survivorship. A strategy has been conducted for these matters. One prerogative was the assist, uh, information on livestock depredation and test preventive methods to significantly reduce losses in function of increasing the farmers' tolerance to the species. In order to start working, I had to break the trial, the local tradition of raising the peculiar chicken breed on free range style. After years of education spreads of discussions coexistence in 2007, few farms accepted to test a special design chicken coop to de protect the poultry. The good results of this experience spread out in the region. Since then, I have visited over 500 farms, telling people about the importance of the many wolves and especially helping to solve problems related to the predators. predators. Half of them are constantly monitored concerning the depredation rates and the wolves' presence which the data obtained a model on conflict severity was elaborated to drive the decisions for the installment of new units. The install of the chicken coops was the ultimate alternative as an effective preventive method among others tested has predicted the depredation rates dropping to zero or in farms that receive the chicken coops. Together with uh, people awareness, by building a total of the 140 units, the numbers of men and wolves killed have been drastically reduced in the region. Nowadays, uh, we have been working in total area of around 1,200 square miles in the surrounds of the Serra da Canastra National Park. There we have strong confidence to see that we eradicate the many wolf persecution and killings. Nowadays, the animals they are the dent only the zones rare and didn't reach yet. Besides the livestock protection, a good incentive in the farms come from the commerce of eggs. This was neglected before. Due to the high loss of eggs, since the chickens were living in a friend range, when showing, when showing interest or helping to solve along that the problem and bridging economic benefits 
the families. We convince the farmers to engage in nature conservation actions. We turn them into men and wolf friends. <laughs> so as consequence of the work and the outcome of the education and communication actions result in the friends of the Men and Wolf project. From the other sources we have uh, been observing from the conservation program, we felt that it is now time to spend the activities to, to the other areas and start to operate in different scenarios. Thus, we plan to start this year the replication of project in place three these pieces in the under this say sort of impacts from the small actions added to the good ideas and a lot of patience I have been fighting for the environment which great balance between economic development and nature management. Always seeking for new partners is a journey. So I do believe that, that when researchers, conservationists, and local people work together, as we see Serra da Canastra, the results the project a better future for the endangered species, for the human communities, for nature, for the society in general. Only by working together, joining efforts, we will have a better and tolerant world with wildlife and people can a peaceful share the space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. That was a really inspiring story, um, a, a wonderful solution to helping to preserve the main wolf. So thank you so much. Um, our next speaker, uh, Deborah Scheer, is uh, from San Diego Zoo, from the uh, Conservation Research Institute. And she really um, is doing work uh, very close to my heart because she studies the behavior of animals and how that knowledge can help us in conservation success stories. Deborah. Thank you. Oh, my background is gone. Um, I think it was on the transfer, but is the, the whole the background whole is gone. But maybe we'll just go with it. Should we just? They'll just give it a try. So I had okay. a pretty picture up here, but it's not here. Is it up? Uh, it's, it's not. Smart. It's gone. It's in the oh. other version. Oh. That's okay. Um, we'll just go with this. Hopefully, hopefully you'll get to see um, most of my slides. Um, so it, uh, thank you for inviting me. And I'm thrilled to come and share with you some of our work that we've been doing at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research. We've been hearing some really inspiring stories today, and I hopefully I'll share one with you as well. Um, we all know that as humans continue to degrade and fragment habitat, more and more species are being extirpated from all or part of their historic range. And in order to prevent extinction of these vulnerable species, wildlife managers have turned increasingly to captive breeding, reintroduction, or translocation, moving animals from areas where they're being impacted to areas where they're protected, such as national parks, private conservation land, or reserves. Now the goal of relocation is obviously survival, reproductive success, and ultimately to establish a viable population of your target species. But most uh, reintroductions actually don't meet these goals. In the first days to weeks following release, animals leave the release sites. You put them there, they take off. They are more vulnerable to predators if they're prey species, and some of them just simply have a hard time finding a way to navigate through our human modified landscape. So today, I'm going to share with you a translocation success story, talk to, you how, talk to you about how we approach relocation programs, 
how dedication and perseverance and collaboration, which we've heard a lot about today, um, can really help us bring those species back from the brink of extinction. Through my career, I've worked on a variety of different species and um, incorporating basic behavioral science into recovery of these animals. But today, I'm going to share with you a story about a species that's near and dear to my heart, um, the endangered Stevens kangaroo rat. Well, these are totally different, but that's OK. Um, the slides are just, all the colors are off. Um, anyway, so uh, I was 22 when I was first called the rat lady. <laughs> it was really, I was taken aback by that at that age. and. Um, really sort of thought, gosh, I should have studied something huge and charismatic, like a wolf or a rhino. Um, but my father actually had talked to me a couple years before and said, you know, anybody can try to save an elephant because it's easy to convince people to do that. It takes a really special person to want to save something that most people think is a pest. Um, the truth is, I got lucky. And kangaroo rats are rodents, yes. But they are awe-inspiring in their own right. They are not your typical rodents that you have running through your house and your kitchen cupboards. They're actually no more closely related to other mice and rats than humans are to monkeys. They, are, um, they live in our deserts, our grasslands, and our scrublands in western US and uh, down into Mexico. Um, and they're found nowhere else in the world. Everything about them is adapted to living in a dry environment. Their morphology, their physiology, and their behavior allow them to persist in these areas. So for example, they never have to take a single drink of water in their life. They get all of their water needs met metabolically through the extraction from their seeds, um, they, which really has served them well in the drought that we've had in California. They have excellent low frequency hearing, and they have co-evolved with owls such that they can actually hear the wing beats of a barn owl from a distance. And because they're solitary and territorial, they have to coordinate their mating activities with <coughs> other individuals, mostly at a distance. So they drum their feet to talk to each other through the ground. Super cool animals. They also play a critical role in ecosystem function. They are primary seed dispersers from the native plants that they um, they support, they are prey species for multiple predators, and they dig burrows, which their digging activities increase soil hydrology and nutrient cycling. So without them, literally, the ecosystem completely can type convert. There was a really nice study by Brown and Heskey in 1990 in the, in the um, science magazine that showed when you remove three species of kangaroo rats from an area, you type convert from a desert scrub to a grassland habitat, completely changes. So they truly are ecosystem engineers. They are listed endangered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, by the IUCN, and threatened in the state of California. And they have an extremely limited range, you can see in the, in the orange there. That was in the 1980s. We have lost about half of that habitat to development since then. The promise was to put half of the, um, the occupied lands into reserves and give the rest up to development. And that's where we get our animals for translocation. If we're to save those individuals, we have to translocate them onto reserves. The problem is that the reserves that were established were not designed to support kangaroo rats. So what we see a lot of in California is invasive grasses. These are European grasses, bromes and, and oats. And they create basically a carpet out there. Well, kangaroo rats need open space to communicate to each other. They sand bathe on the surface of the ground, and they obviously need to be able to move through the landscape. So there are lots of problems that they're facing. Development continues. Reserves contain unsuitable habitat. And multiple translocations have been done with kangaroo rats that have failed. In fact, in one case, biologists moved 600 of them onto a reserve. And less than a year later, there wasn't a single one left. So it was a pretty doom and gloom situation for the kangaroo rats, especially for this species, the Stevens kangaroo rat. But what it had going for it was multiple folks across agencies that were interested in the recovery of the species. 
So my team at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research got involved and took up the challenge of designing an effective protocol, a translocation protocol for the species that, that um, would take into account the species behavioral ecology to try to move forward with recovery. We work within an adaptive management framework in which you identify the problem, you design and implement experiments, you monitor and evaluate your results, and you incorporate lessons learned. And this is an iterative process that keeps going around with every experiment that you do until you get to the point where you actually have an effective protocol. So I'm going to use uh, SKR, Stevens kangaroo rat, to illustrate this process. Now kangaroo rats are, live alone, like I said. They're solitary. They defend their territories from their neighbors, but they know their neighbors. So Duane knows that Amal lives over there, Susan lives next door, and Sophia lives behind them. And they're more likely to mate with those neighbors than they are with strangers. So, and the dear enemy hypothesis in behavioral ecology suggests that strangers are more of a threat to you than neighbors, even if you're solitary. And if you think about it, it makes sense. So neighbors are going to compete with you for food, but strangers are going to compete with you for both food and try to take your house. So I reasoned that if we moved uh, kangaroo rats with their neighbors, they would be more likely to survive following release. We went about the translocation process. We have to modify the habitat, as I said, because where we get to move the kangaroo rats onto the reserves, none of it is pristine habitat. It's all covered in invasive grasses. So we have to do something to open it up. We put in acclimation cages. We mark, observe, and recapture to bring, um, uh, to, to figure out who we're looking at and where they live. We bring them into holding. I don't know what's going on here. We bring them into holding, and we put them into soft release cages for about a week so that they can acclimate to the area. And then we put on little transmitter backpacks. I made these little backpacks out of candy necklace cord, um, and we track them so we don't get to put on giant collars like you do with rhinos, but the tiny little backpacks, they don't make GPS yet for these guys. They're too small. So if somebody's interested in, in doing something with engineering, that would be a great place to go. Um, and then we go back out there and survey and see what happened. So we found that, sure enough, translocating them, oh my gosh, the colors are such a mess. But uh, so what you can see is translocating them with strangers, which is the, the left bars, um, they do much worse all the way across to a year. So these are the ones that are neighbor translocated. And uh, up until three, they, they, they are more successful, three times more successful by one year post so if they're translocated with their neighbors. But more importantly for kangaroo rats is to see that reproduction in the wild. And strikingly, kangaroo rats that were translocated with their neighbors were 24 times higher um, in terms of their, the number of pups they produced on the release site. So this strategy was really the difference between success and failure of this program. And we repeat this process. As I said, it's sort of iterative. So that was one experiment. We wanted to identify some other issues. We had some other problems with the release. So like I said, predation is a huge issue when you're moving a, a prey species. We also have them leave the release sites. We wanted to figure a way to dampen dispersal. And then, of course, we have to modify the sites in to accommodate the kangaroo rats. So we went through a process of trying to figure out whether mowing, grazing, or burning would be a better way to, to move those animals. And we, we did experiments. So in this case, we uh, actually put out cougar urine to see if we could reduce uh, mesopredator visitation on our release sites and found that it works. If you release kangaroo rats into sites with cougar urine, you're more likely to have successful uh, releases. In terms of dampening dispersal, we put out kangaroo rat scent to sort of make it smell like kangaroo rats so they'd be more likely to stay there. And then in terms of mowing, grazing, and prescribed burning, we did all three of those treatments on large-scale translocation. and. Guess what? They like prescribed burns the best. And this is why. This is what the sites look like about a year later. This is a grazing site. It looks great when you first do it, but one year later, it's completely grown back in. This is what it looks like a year after the burn. It completely opened up, a forb release, a lot of diversity. The kangaroo rats love it, and it persists over time. <coughs> so as I said at the beginning of my talk, 
The most successful relocations are those that are have interagency support and collaboration. Again, we've heard a lot about that. It's together that we can be most effective with these conservation programs. As everybody has said, landowners, land managers, the agencies, actually the politicians help a lot too because they sometimes can bring the money in. And in this case, we brought in Cal Fire and it was a win-win for them. They got to come out and do some training on our sites and we got our areas burned. So it worked out really well. We also brought up prison crews to do all of our weed whacking. Um, so it was a, a very collaborative project. And for SKR, the ability to develop an effective translocation method has really saved hundreds and hundreds of animals. We have established six new populations. And um, if our progress continues and the managers continue to manage those habitats, in the next few years, we might actually see this species removed from the endangered species list, which is ultimately the sign of hope in conservation. Thank you. Deborah, thank you so much. So um, our last speaker in this session this afternoon is Dennis Wiggum. And Dennis is with the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Institute and he is a plant ecologist. And we often tend, I think, to forget plants and the fact that so many species are endangered. And Dennis is a highly experienced um, expert in this area has worked on many, many different species of plants. And today he's going to talk about a program conserving orchids. So, Dennis. Thank you. Well, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk about some charismatic plants that are quite nice. And uh, first of all, I'm going to start out by thanking uh, Gary Kropnik and Tom Miranda. Most of what I'm going to be presenting was uh, a talk that we gave at the IUCN meeting uh, last year. And it's about a, an effort to conserve orchids that is focused primarily in North America but has a real uh, global perspective. So let me start with sort of two slides that are the other side, why things are not good. So uh, there may be 30,000 species of, of uh, orchids in the world something in that neighborhood. And the, the larger pie you see here is the result of an assessment of less than 1,000 of those species, something about 13%. Uh, and you can see just on the color coding there that those that have been assessed, they're not, it's not going very well. As an ecologist, if I'm to ask, well, how much ecological knowledge do we have about those species that have been assessed or all of the species in the world to make sound ecological decisions about conservation, my best guess is probably less than 1%. So we don't know much about a lot of the species that are out there. If we put a, a North American perspective on it, here are pictures of, of native orchids in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, there are about 220 species in the, in the two countries, small number, but about 10% of all the orchid genera in the world. And somewhere, almost 60% of them are in trouble somewhere in their range of distribution. So whether you look globally or whether you look uh, at the scale of, the, of this continent, uh, it's, it's not a very good story. And uh, when I became interested in this, I realized that there was no organization in the world that was focusing on the conservation of orchids, either at a national level or certainly an international level. Most of the orchid conservation work was going out, collecting things, putting names on them, and trying to keep them alive, perhaps, in a, in a greenhouse. That isn't going to cut it. So, so we had the opportunity to do something about this. And about four years ago, we established the North American Orchid Conservation Center, and our mission is really simple. It's to conserve the genetic diversity of all the native orchids, initially in the U.S. and Canada, but showing that that model works, we're going to think globally about all the 30,000 species that are out there. So how does this work? What kind of a model do we have? Uh, it's basically an ecological model, and it involves four pillars. The first thing is we have to learn how to propagate uh, native orchids. Very few of them are propagated and for reasons I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, part of the story is we have to uh, identify, isolate, and have the fungi that the orchids need in order to complete their life cycle. So we need fungal banks. We also need seed banks. The, the idea is to collect the genetic diversity that is local. We want local genes basically dealing with the conservation of the species at a local level. And then, you know, we live in a world with uh, a lot of botanical illiteracy. And I think we can use orchids because they're charismatic to, to educate the public in some of the stories we heard in this morning's sessions about getting kids involved and the public involved. 
But none of this will work unless we, we go outside our ivory towers and involve the public. So all of these things involve people, basically holding this model up. And the first thing is it involves collaboration. We can't do this ourselves. There are very few people doing this kind of research. And so uh, initially when we set up the, the, the NAOC, uh, we, we had partners all around the U.S. And you'll notice there are botanical gardens in here and other organizations. So globally, within the continent, we're looking to, to outreach. Since we launched this, we have, and this is just partial, we have now 50, over 50 different collaborators around the U.S. that are, are on board with us at one level or another with this activity. Talk a little bit about the fungi. And the idea here, again, is to, to conserve the genetic diversity of uh, fungi that interact with orchids. And this is not a simple story at all. Most of you, if you know anything about plants, you know that almost all the plant species on Earth interact with fungi. Those interactions are mutualistic. The plant gets something, the orchid gets something. Orchid fungal interactions are just the opposite of that. The orchids are by far the smartest plant species on Earth. They have figured out how to co-opt fungi. And what orchids do is they eat fungi. And that's an important thing because orchids have two stages in their life cycle, one a critical one between a seed and a seedling where there's, they cannot photosynthesize. So the only way they can grow from a, an embryo to a seedling is to get their food from somewhere, and they get it by eating fungi. A lot of orchids also have a dormant stage, which can last up to decades, where a plant is below ground. It never produces a leaf. And how does something live in the dirt without ever producing a leaf if you're a plant? Well, you have to get your food from somewhere else, and you get it from fungi. So for orchid conservation, we have to put fungi. And this shows you all the life history stages where fungi are critical. And we know very little about these fungi, but we now can do things that we have molecular tools that are very exciting. We can get the fungi out of the orchid root. They form these little things called pelotons, which are like little balls of cotton in the cells of the, of the, uh, the root. We can grow them in the lab. We can do things with them. We can extract their DNA. We can find out what they are. We have the largest collection in the world at the Smithsonian now, over 600 isolates. 99.99999% of them are completely unknown to science. And eventually, once this works, we're going to have tens of thousands of these things, and we need to be able to put them into long-term storage. And this year, we're starting an effort to look into uh, cryopreservation, working with our colleagues at, at the SCBI. Seed banks, the same thing. We want local seeds, local genetic diversity. Uh, we are establishing regional seed banks. And uh, some seeds are stored in individual labs, obviously, for research purposes. But there also will be a national backup at a USDA facility in Colorado. Here's the key. We have to learn how to propagate orchids. We know how to grow a handful of native orchids. And, uh, and they're really just from a few species, and we just can't do it unless we learn how to put the fungi together with the seeds to create sustainable populations. And this is really ecosystem ecology. You have to create a habitat that has the right conditions for the fungus to be happy, for the orchid to be happy, so that they can produce babies and go on and on. Nobody is doing that for any orchid species yet. Uh, give you some views of this, so what they look like. These slides on the left are you see seeds and these protocorms, the stage that only can get to a seedling if it eats a fungus. And uh, on the right, you see sort of the growing of these little baby orchids, which is not easy, but you know you can do it with and without uh, fungi. And then the critical link here is education. We need to, to have the public involved with us. We need to engage botanical gardens in this process. And we need to get citizen science involved in it also. And we're starting to do that. We have this website. I encourage you to go to it. It's called Go Orchids. It's an interactive website. It has all of the native orchids in the US and Canada on it. You can go in by indicating where you are. You can go in as a, as a botanist and key things out. Or you can say, I, I know the name of this orchid. Up will come a, a species page. It'll tell you everything that we know about that orchid. We also are, are develop, uh, have developed with a collaborator in the, in the Netherlands, a designer, Orchid Gamis. <laughs> And uh, these are being really actively now used in exhibits and educational activities. Uh, I can give you a link to these off of the, off the internet. You can uh, print them, cut them out, and play with them. We have six of them, are, them that are printed now and as punch outs. I, can, I have some of those with me. And uh, this is what they look like, the front and the back on the top. And then this is an example of Ken Cameron out at the University of Wisconsin making these big blow ups of these uh, orkagami models and using them in educational activities. So how do we implement the model? Well, we have a regional approach. We want to have regions around the country where they're co collecting the fungi, the seeds, getting involved in propagation and education. 
This is our current map. We have uh, over 50% of the, uh, the states now involved in the process and ever growing. And we're uh, also moving outside the country, but one of the keys in this is, will be to have botanical gardens involved because they, they're interested in growing things and we want them to become interested in sustainably growing uh, native orchids. So where the effort stands, I mentioned that we have 50% uh, of, the, of the states uh, are now involved in this. Uh, we, we finally have secured some funding for a development coordinator who makes my life much better. And uh, we have a first small endowment that we've uh, received. And we have these two websites, the one I showed you uh, a bit here a minute ago. And, and the model that we have is now being attracted outside of the U.S. We have a contract with the Forest Service to start an effort out in the uh, Pacific on all the islands that the, that the Forest Service works on. We're going to start in Palau this uh, June. And uh, there's a group of nine countries in Western Europe that are taking our model, and they have a proposal into the EU to start in Western Europe. And we already have one funded in Greece and Turkey. And just uh, last week, I learned that uh, a colleague in Australia is going to be presenting to that group uh, a similar kind of model for, for Australia. So the idea, I think, is, is a good, solid one that people are going on. And we're optimistic. You know, you've got to be optimistic about these things. So we think it's good to have a, a model that's based on ecological concepts and, and, and citizen science. And, and, and the activity that we've been seeing, it's really expanding rapidly. Uh, we're sure that we're going to be able to reach our initial goals, which is to collect material from all the U.S. and Canadian species over the next five years. And as I mentioned, it's already reaching out uh, globally. And, uh, and like all the things that we've heard about this afternoon, long-term success depends on securing the funding to make this happen, and we're, we're very hopeful that that will happen also. And I'll end with some acknowledgments. Uh, Jay O'Neill has been working with me at the Smithsonian for 39 years, uh, and he's, he's kind of passionate about these things uh, in learning how to grow the, the fungi and the orchidomies. Melissa McCormick does all the molecular work that we've been doing. And then our Smithsonian colleagues who helped us get this off the ground, uh, the people at Smithsonian Gardens. And initially, this is a collaboration between the U.S. Botanical Garden and the Smithsonian, and we really appreciate all the efforts that they have. And what sort of got me turned on from being just a dumb old plant ecologist to a fungal orchid kind of ecologist was Hannah Rasmussen, who came, came over from Denmark. She had done some of the early work in Europe on, on fungi. And then, of course, uh, some of the funding sources, both internal at the Smithsonian and some of the grant programs that supported us so far. So with that, thank you very much. Dennis, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure all orchid lovers will be more hopeful than ever. Um, we have about six minutes for questions, so I'd like all the speakers to come up, if you would, um, and we'll, we'll field some questions from the audience. So uh, maybe I can start off with, with a question. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about collaboration and people. Uh, what do you think is the uh, most important thing to co for continued success of your program? Would you like to start? Sure. Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm going to go back to what I said before, <coughs> cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. We cannot do this alone. Uh, there are many of us, I think, battling the same battles everywhere to save species, save, you know, by both fauna and flora. Um, and we all have the same goals at the end of the day, so why not come together and work together to achieve these goals and make sure these species are saved at the end of the day? So when, you know, going back to, to where we work in Nepal and India, we work with governments, in an, in including multiple stakeholders, you know, like WWF, other NGOs, communities. Everyone comes together to move this work forward. And that's how we've been able to see some success on the ground. So I think from my perspective that, you know, Collaboration, cooperation is critical. Thank you very much. And, and Eric, would you like to add to that or agree with that? Well, I would second that. And we heard some excellent talks this morning about talking cooperation with the local communities. One of my favorite quotes, um, St. Louis is part of another collaborative program called the Madagascar Fauna and Flora Group, as is San Diego and some of our partners in the room. But the governor of that province said, uh, and he was trained at the Sorbonne. I think sometimes we think, well, what do they know in Madagascar? He said, in this, that you could substitute any of these, so many of these countries. He said, Madagascar is a land where biodiversity and poverty coexist. For biodiversity to win, poverty must lose. 
And so we need to work with the local people to make sure that there's, it's beneficial for them, not just our values being uh, top layered onto them. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, yeah. yeah. You go right ahead. Mm -hmm. You go right ahead. Uh, I'll, add, I'll add something. I think, you know, we all have day jobs, and, and we're busy doing lots of different things. But what I find in the collaborative side of what we're doing now is, is it gives us energy. When, when we find citizen science folks out there who see what we're doing and get excited about it, that feeds back and enables us to continue to going. Because most of these things, it's a long slog. You really have to stay with it, and collaboration is a key in that. I see we, we have a question. Um, if you'd like to. Me? Yes, please, pose your question. Uh, thanks a lot. This is Eric from Manga Bay. We're a conservation news website. And uh, we have a long running uh, series going on Asian rhinos. And uh, we recently covered, uh, again, Kazaranga Park in India, um, which has a lot, has like 2,400 rhinos. Unfortunately, at least 18 were poached last year, and um, you know, and it's a crazy situation with uh, the guards uh, ha are having duels with uh, poachers who have AK-47s, and these guards are using carbines from like World War One era sort of situation. So it's it's a very fraught kind of thing, and mostly we've been just reporting like what the bad news is, but I'm um, looking for. Since it's the theme of the day as well, like Jonga, do you know of any like solutions, like positive education, outreach, that kind of thing? Is it, is anything really working? Um, I, absolutely, I believe so. I think even the fact that Kaziranga now has about twenty four hundred rhinos, and mm -hmm. you know, I've been there, I've seen them, they're everywhere. It's pretty amazing. You can see them from the one of the roads as you're going by, and they they're grazing, they're wallowing um, in water holes, etc. And it's it's a wonderful success story. But as I mentioned before, we have to keep at it. We have to remain vigilant because the threat hasn't gone away. We're celebrating a success today, but if we let up at any point, it's going to go back down to where it was before. So we have to keep at it. We have to communicate with each other. And a lot of that has to do with a lot of transboundary collaborations as well between India and Nepal. Everyone comes together to talk about you know, rhino conservation periodically and work together. In addition to all of the stakeholders I mentioned, you know, countries need to work together as well. And I think there has been a lot of awareness out there and people are working together. Um, and I think despite the incredible odds that we're facing. I think this is a success story that we should be celebrating. Yes, I can oh, um, sort of, it's actually pretty related to your question, and it was brought up this morning about the vaquita, um, and that's something that's embroiled, and there's been lots of efforts by foundations and you know people on the ground, and I'm just curious if anyone has any insights because those numbers as we all know are dropping so significantly and it's you know organized crime and I mean every angle is really fraught with a lot of challenge so I'm just curious uh, if anyone has any insights on on that on some hope around that because it's pretty um, depressing <laughs> I could take a stab um, so it is one of the most endangered marine mammals, as you know, uh, and numbers are dropping very rapidly. And they, the reason for that is because they're being caught in nets uh, as bycatch, nets that are targeted for another species called the totoaba. Um, and their swim bladder is in high demand in places like China. So it's an illegal fishery. By the way, Totoaba is also endangered. And it's an illegal fishery, and these vaquitas are being caught in it and are dying. Um, so I think there is momentum right now, definitely, to do something about it. Every expert that we can think of has come together now. So we're moving forward. We have yet to see where that's going to go, because it is such a complicated issue um, that has a lot of connections to organized crime. So it is a tricky issue, but I think everyone is coming together to do something about it right now because we're at the 11th hour. So things, we are doing something about it. It just remains to be seen if we are too late or not, but we can't give up. That's why we do what we do. So it's being worked on for sure.
And I, I think, to me, one of the really hopeful things about this session was that a lot of species that are being worked on have not got quite so close to the brink. Um, and I think it's really important that we identify problems as much as we can before they get to that point. Uh, I think a, a really hopeful um, marine story is the right whale. Um, and that, that is a story on the, on the northeast of where this species were thought, was thought to be going extinct in the 60s. Then a relic population was found in the Bay of Fundy. And scientists uh, at the New England Aquarium and elsewhere collaborated right up from Nova Scotia all the way down to Florida. Um, that species, there's still a lot of work to do, but it went from 300 to 500. And there is still its ongoing struggle. Um, now the, uh, the, the threat is not so much ship strike, which through a lot of collaboration, that word again, um, the ship lanes were moved and the collision went right down. Now it is entanglement. Again, it's inadvertent entanglement, but like the vaquita, not for an illegal fishery, but from the fact that ropes are being made stronger and stronger, and in fact, far stronger than the gear requires. And the hopeful news is that there is a big collaboration of people working to provide the fishermen with weaker ropes that the whales can break out of. So again, trying to make sure it doesn't get to the point um, where it's so low. At least with the vaquita, maybe we can keep them in captivity. With the whales, we can't do that. Uh, are there any more questions? I think we have about one minute, and then it's tea break. Any last comments from the panel? Did you want to say something? Well, then, thank you all very much indeed.